I'm Rowan Reid. Uh, this is the Hartwood podcast and probably the first one we're ever going to run. And uh, I'm going to start it over here in Western Australia, despite coming from Victoria myself. And I'm on the property of David and Di Jenkins and I'm in their mill shed and I'm looking straight at a log that's about a, almost a metre in diameter sitting under a Lucas sawmill. And uh, David owns a Lucas mill, I own a bandsaw mill, and I thought it might be really interesting to have a discussion about the advantages and disadvantages of each as uh, small-scale portable sawmills. Uh, David, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Rowan. We're, um, Rowan's been over here finishing off a master tree grower program, which is uh, unbelievably amazing because he keeps coming across the country all over the place doing these courses. And uh, we've got the opportunity to talk about our milling process, which we've talked lots about over the phone and over to each other and I've run a Lucas mill now for many years and um, I find them really good. They're, they're easily portable. I put them on the back of my Rodeo ute with a couple of frames to handle the long bits and I can take them from farm to farm. I do a lot of milling for other people, usually wind blown trees and uh, find it very easy to set up. I can put it on the ute, it takes about half an hour to get on the ute, half an hour to get it off and set it up and have the mill running. So uh, you've had Lucas Mills for a number of years and this is not the first one you've had? No, this is the third one. Third one. Yeah. Now that's interesting because we both started planting trees. I'm looking out the door at these 1987 planted Sydney blue gums, huge trees, beautiful forest we're in, and uh, I planted our first trees in 1987. I've had three bandsaw mills in that period. Oh, so right. our first two bandsaw mills were Norwoods from North America and the one we have now is a GT40 from uh, Hardwood Mills in Australia. So this is, what model of this Australian Lucas mill have you got? This, this particular one's a 10-inch mill, a Lucas 10 by 30, 30 horsepower motor, 10-inch uh, maximum cut, or 250 mil. Um, the previous mills, I started with a 6 inch mill and then went to an 8 inch, which I still have. I usually take the 8 inch to jobs. Mm. The 10 inch ones set up here in the shed. Uh, I like to keep it here, but occasionally I, people want to, some wider boards, so I take take it take the motor head uh, to to wherever they want to have it. Uh, both. Both heads fit on the same frames, but the, yeah, this mill, this model is their latest model. I think it's their biggest mill. Um, I find it very, very good because, uh, as I said, easy to set up, quite quick to move, and once you've got the log in position and the mill on top of it, every time you walk backwards and forwards, you've got a piece of wood that's presumably usable. Yeah. So between the the bandsaw mill, I've got the. It's interesting again. I've got the largest of the of the Australian ones and with a bit of hydraulics in it but fundamentally if we compare the two types of mills um, one yours is a swing blade rotary what how do you describe yeah, what yeah, it it's is a rotary, it's a normal saw with only five teeth uh, the blade runs vertically one way and horizontally the other it swings with a lever that changes the position position uh, it's all manually operated you push it um, there's no hydraulics the mill sits above the log, the log sits stationary on, on some plinths which get it up off the ground a little bit. The disadvantage is that uh, when you've got a big log of more than a metre, uh, I think the maximum the mill will take is about 1.3, um, uh, is that the mill you're operating it right at head height uh, and sawdust <laughs> and, and uh, crap gets thrown into your face. So if we compare just that, that's the swing blade and the band saws are horizontal band saws. And the difference is, in this case, the Lucas mill I'm looking at, the log is sitting on the ground, as you said, on a couple of plinths. In our case, we have to put the log on the bench and run the mill along tracks. And the band saw mill only cuts horizontally. So to do a vertical cut, you've actually got to turn the log. And in your case, you turn the machine. Turn the blade, yeah. 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 And that gives you, so your, your kerf, the amount that the blade actually cuts out? Yeah, well, that's that's probably a disadvantage. Um, some people call them wood chippers because they have a six mil curve, which is quite a substantial. If you're cutting tomato steaks, there's a lot of wood that gets 
thrown out in the sawdust. Well, you do notice that, the difference when there's a very big sawdust pile right beside <laughs> us, and uh, on our mill it takes takes weeks and months to actually build up a pile that big. Yeah, I can do that in a day. <laughs> the, um, the bandsaw mills run on about three millimetre kerf, or one-eighth of an inch. So when you move the blade up and down, you have to add one-eighth of an inch to it, so you account for that, and presumably you account for the the kerf each time you do a cut as well by how far you move the mill across or yeah, down. Yeah, the, the Lucas mill have these uh, gauges on either end of the mill which if you've got an offsider helping you it makes it easier and quicker because they wind the mill down at each end. Uh, I usually operate the motor end and the offsider operates the back end. And But the kerf is set in the gauge of six mil right at the top of the, ga- the gauge so you would, you adjust the gauge by adding that six mil each time you drop it, and the same thing on the horizontal gauge on the on the mill head. So it, you know now most of the logs you're milling on the farm are, are relatively big eucalypt logs. Is that be yeah. right? Yeah, and most of the logs around the district that I mill are Jarrah or Mary or a bit of black butt, and they're usually fairly big logs. Uh, usually old growth trees that have been paddock trees that have either fallen. Uh, from wind storms or wind damage, um, and there's an amazing amount of wood that's that gets, still gets pushed up and burnt in WA. From people just don't realise the benefits of having these portable mills. They're starting to change yeah. now. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Well, the closure of native forests might be turning, and the increasing price of timber, even yeah. just for cattle yards and fences. Exactly. It's, a, yeah. it's changing dramatically. Uh, so in our case, that's one of the, one of the reasons people say, why did I choose a bandsaw mill? Why did you choose a Lucas? I think you've really got to start with what you're milling up and how big those logs are going to get, um, how stable they are with regard to uh, where you, how you sit the mill around them or whether you put them on the mill. And in our case, I was looking for a mill that would cut from quite small diameter up to large, but the limit on ours is, well, it's called a GT40 because 40 inches is supposed to be your maximum in, in terms of, of how big a log could be. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean the width of the cut is 40 inches. It actually just means you can get a 40-inch log on there and start cutting it yeah, off. And I have got up to a metre on it, and uh, it does take a lot of work moving mm. it around, and, and uh, they're very heavy logs. But fortunately, the, the hardwood mills have an extremely strong carriage that you put it on. And, uh, but we wouldn't be able to mill the log I'm looking at. So you've got one example there, log size, that says that you know one mill can't do what the other mill can do in, the, in this case. And the Lucas is certainly good for those big mills and the equipment you're using. Like if you go to a site, they might be able to pull or push a log, but not lift a log. And in this case, they could push it under the mill or you could build, build the, the mill, mill over, over it. Log. Yeah. So you set the mill up over the log, even in the paddock. Yeah. And so those big logs don't have to be lifted and moved. But in our case, we have to lift the log onto the bench, and that's getting really tricky. Even we've got a 100-horsepower tractor, front-end loader, can't really lift two tonnes, two and a half tonnes. No. And no. Uh, you told me how much volume do you think's in that log? Yeah, about 1.6 cubes. It's only three metres long? Mm. Yeah. So that, that was the second log of a tree. Yeah. Uh, the first log, three metres, had yeah. just over two cubes in it, and the tractor couldn't lift that, I had to. Yeah. So how long? Are, how do you, how do you do longer logs? What's the uh, the mill the, the mill itself will cut up to it's got two extensions that you can fit at each end. So yeah. it'll cut six point three without uh, with the extensions on, uh, and there I do have some other extensions. I can add another couple of meters. Oh wow! In yeah. the middle, yeah, um, and I have cut up to eight meters long, yeah. um, and then you can, of course you can put. Uh, you can put two mills together, so I guess you go and borrow someone else's someone Lucas else's frame mill and frame, and you can yeah. you can add them together and infinitely long log, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's another limitation of the hardwood mill. I got a a long bed, and I suppose you can buy and extend the trailer bed. And uh, we've been for our house, we cut five point sixes, five point eights, I think, mm. so we can get five point three, five point five in the building. And uh, that worked well. Those logs were so heavy. They were just pines, but I had to lift one end and then the other end yeah. and roll it onto the mill. But um, So that's one point. The, the bandsaw mill is great because it's got a narrow kerf. Uh, I find 
I really wanted one because I'm obsessed about cortisoring, as you know, David. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we've talked about backsorn and cortisorn. And, and if, if you're not familiar with that, it's the way that the, 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 the rectangular sized bit of wood, which is generally what we're producing, you're producing one inch by... by 130 mil. Yeah, so these are for floorboards, yeah. uh, for beams, it might be a two inch piece by... So everything's sort of rectangular. And backsorn means that the, the growth rings actually go from edge to edge, largely, whereas cortisorn, they go face to face. And I've always been a bit obsessed about cortisorn for a number of reasons. It produces certainly a more stable bit of timber. It's less likely to cup. And if you're milling species that might have fiddleback in it, you only see that on the cortisorn face. And if you've got species like silky oak or English oak or banksia or she oaks that have that medullary ray, you're not going to see that shine up unless you do it on the quarter. So I was looking for a mill that I could rotate the log and get that precise cut through on the quarter sawn face and get as much of that feature timber out. And uh, it's worked really well for us because we're trying to do a lot of quarter sawn, make that our comparative difference with conventional uh, timber supplies. And uh, because of that feature and the furniture grade quality of the, the timber, uh, I see that as a great advantage. Now, we've talked a bit about how you can do quarter sawn on the Lucas, and you can. Yeah, you can. You can do a vertical cut like at the start of the log, you take the top piece off, it's just usually sap, sap wood and bark. Uh, and then you can dive in vertically, have your long cut vertical into the, into the middle of the log from the top. I tend not to do that. I, I'd like to have, I just go back sawn. And then in the past, I've pretty much back sawn most of the log because when I, once I get to where I could get some decent quarter sawn, once you get to the near the heart, yeah. uh, I then, then started to do the vertical cut there. So I was actually avoiding the uh, quarter sawn boards. And that was just because it was more productive that way. Yeah, you get more material out if you do back sawn. Yeah. Um, it's uh, just whether I think, you know, whether there's a quality difference or whether the, the market or your own use really cares about the difference. Yeah. The flooring that I have been producing is from the Sydney Blue Gum here. It's, um, it's very attractive. It's, it's lighter lighter than the local Jarrah wood. It's lighter in colour. It's lighter in colour. And uh, it's, it's hard and it's floors, the floor layers have been very happy with it with the process and the way it's performing and the finished product on the floor looks magnificent so and that's mostly back sawn yeah you do get that wavy cathedral grain in the back sawn mm. pieces which people like but like, like most mills whatever way you do it you're going to get a combination of both once you get into yeah. the yeah that's true it's yeah. riff, riff sawn isn't it when it's, when yeah riff sawn is halfway between and yeah. uh, the but, the other point particularly where both of us are milling eucalypt logs uh, particularly if they're long eucalypt logs from tall trees, uh, they can have pronounced growth stresses in them. So when you cut along, you're releasing the inherent growth stresses in the tree. Now, we'll probably talk more about tree science in other podcasts, but growth stress is essentially there to allow the tree to bend and then pull back up straight. So even a straight tree, if it's very tall, moving in the wind, may have tension wood forming on the outside. We're talking about hardwood trees like eucalypts. Uh, poplars and casuarinas, these are species often have a lot of pronounced growth stresses in them. So when you cut through a log, you're releasing that tension. And, uh, well, the common term is a banana board. You cut a board, you're cutting straight, but it ends up, as soon as it comes off the saw, it's the shape of a banana. Mm. So what I like about the bandsaw mill is because I can cut up to, a, a, you know, almost a metre right through the middle of a log, I can break the log down into five pieces and then it's very tedious in a way, but break it down into five pieces, throw the middle core away because that has no value to me. And then those other four pieces, the growth stresses have been released and I bring them back onto the sawmill and recut them. Get them uh, straight. The cut, recut them straight. In some cases I have to even do a straightening cut. So mm. if it's a four or five metre log, I might lay it down, had a, what used to be a flat surface on it, uh, but now it's like a banana, and I might cut so that there's you know, zero at each end, but four or five mil in the middle, and to straighten that out. If I just keep cutting boards, they would be fat in the middle and mm. thin at each end. 
So how do you find managing the growth stresses in timber on a Lucas? Yeah, well, it, it's a good point, Ryan, because the, you, don't, you can't have that straight and cut. Um, you can possibly cut a big balk and then let the, let the, uh, the stresses do their thing and then do a straightening cut. Uh, but I don't bother with that. I, I find that the bigger the log with these fast-growing eucalypts, yeah. the stresses are much less. And uh, especially with, if you parallel with the middle of the log, if you, if you like, it's usually straight. Once you start getting, especially if you're doing quarter sawn from the edge, it'll spring away from the heart quite dramatically. But as the log gets larger, as your trees get larger, that stress seems to be a lot less. Well, there's a good point you made. If, you tr- if you're doing back sawn boards, the stress is not a problem because it is called bow and you can just nail it out. Yeah. You can lay it flat and when you stack your packs, the bow gets settled. But in, if you're doing quarter sawn, the stresses get expressed as spring. Yeah. And that's when you look at a board laying against a wall and it actually it looks like a moon shape yeah. <laughs> in a yeah. sense. And you, you can't, can't get rid of that. You have, to, you have to straighten, cut that out. So... Our timber, when it went to the sawmill, well, it's not a sawmill, it's just a finishing mill now, our local one, uh, they edged those boards and there's a lot of loss because they had to take off that, that spring yeah. in there. But so back sawing means you don't have as many problems with growth stresses. I'm obsessed with quarter sawing, so I have a growth stress problem, so I've got to break down the log, so I need a mill that does that. Yeah. So what we're getting to, I think, is, is really interesting. These mills, both Australian-made, very becoming quite common on farms. They really have some advantages, each one of them, and they have some limitations. Yep. And um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I'm sort of yeah, tempted, yeah. I wish you lived next door, David, so we could swap the logs around. Yeah. And <laughs> the other thing, the bandsaw mills, like I look at that mill, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a big, you know, big handsaw, really. It's just a pretty basic machine. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the, the bandsaw mills seem to be a bit more complex. There's more things that can go wrong and there's more fiddly things. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the blades particularly because sharpening the blades, uh, what can you do and how long does a blade last? Well, it's a bit like how long's a bit of string really. It depends on what you're cutting. Um, a, lot of our, a lot of our stuff I cut is from gardens as well. Uh, my son Adam's an arborist and he brings home logs from people's gardens that have, have a dubious history of yeah. people making cubby houses and nailing them. I don't think metal does anything, any blade of either a bandsaw or a Lucas mill any, any good at all. And there's only five teeth on the Lucas mill. It's easy to sharpen. And um, there's a little grinder that comes with the machine. Uh, it does a, a basic sharpening, if you like, but once the blades... The blades last quite a while if you're just cutting nice straight timber and no, not much stress in it. Um, some of the marry that I cut is, has a bit of tension and stress over the big knots and even the pine with a big knot can uh, can throw the blade a little bit. Oh, and, yeah. Um, okay. I think probably would with a bandsaw yeah, too, the, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and you hit knots and the, the blade sometimes rides over yeah, the top of them because yeah. they're following the grain. But if it's sharp and it's running well and the mill set up as, as the uh, specifications tell you to do it, it's usually a pretty good, pretty good thing. Um, you can re-tip the blades. I take my blades to a saw doctor and he, he re-tips them. Just a little tungsten tip that gets hmm. silver soldered back onto the blade. Uh, so do you have another blade in the shed that you change over? Yeah, I've got, yeah. I've got for the yeah. eight inch mill, I've got about seven blades. This one I've only got three blades for. Yeah. Uh, so you just simply just swap them over. It takes five minutes. Um, but yeah, uh, what happens, that sometimes the blades lose their tension and they end up like oh, a piece of rubber yeah. uh, and they wobble all over the place. Uh, and there's an art in retensioning, which the saw doctor does. Yeah. I don't even bother to do that. They hit it on an anvil and some yeah. sort of yeah. magic voodoo does, it, does the trick. And, <laughs> you know, saw doctors are pretty clever. Yeah, well, we hope we still have some around in yeah. the future. Um, yeah, so you compare it to the bandsaw blade, it's, a, it's obviously a band, it's a circle. So when you hold it up, it's probably as tall as yourself. So it's got quite a few teeth on it. Yeah. Uh, you can get them with tungsten tip, if we have, but or tungsten carbide tips, or just normal steel tips. Uh, if you're just using a normal one, uh, if you hit anything, it's pretty buggered. Yeah. If you hit a nail, you're pretty well throwing that blade out. Uh, otherwise, it'd 
probably two hours through our eucalypt hardwoods of milling and then you'd swap it over right. and i've got a sharpener and it probably takes uh 15 20 minutes once you set up just to just to tip each one to get a little bit more edge on it and then it should work and we that's I haven't really recorded how many times we've sharpened some of them, but maybe five, ten, ten times sometimes. I find that if it keeps working, cutting straight, I'll keep that blade yeah. and go and sharpen it and put it back. Um, then the tungsten carbide ones, uh, yeah, they they start by just feels like butter. They just go straight through beautifully, and they do cut for longer. And uh, can you resharpen those? Well, I, I tried to, and I destroyed one. And then I've since found out I've using the wrong diamond type of diamond tip okay. sharpener. So we've got a new, new sharpener now. So a new carbide blades just came last week. So we're going to try sharpening those mm. and keep that going. And the blades, um, you can get very cheap ones. Um, you know, I haven't really sort of worked out where the value for money is, but I've been, I'm still going back to Jeff at Hardwood Mills and buying theirs in the hope that uh, that the they, he's had a lot of, you know, he's been talking to Woodmiser where a lot of the blades come from, the American Woodmiser company, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of science in there in in bandsaws as well. So mm. I try to work it out, but I, you know, like your saw doctor, I don't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it's a big difference. You have to have a set of blades on hand, sharpened if you want to mill for a day, uh, and if a blade starts to ride or or waver through that. Uh, Generally change it if it was set previously. If it starts off badly, you have to go back and look at the set of it, how it's running on the wheels and the tension and try to iron that out. And some blades I just can't get to work at all, so I just put them aside and stick mm. to the ones that do. Do you debark your wood before you yeah, start? Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Does it? Yeah. And that's, debarking's not easy. Uh, d the bark comes off eucalypts very easily, or most species. It comes off very easily if the tree is actively growing. So if you're, you know, if you've got a, a good wet autumn or a, a, a good warm spring, you know, it's actually a little bit dangerous. The bark just comes off and the log slides oh, around, yeah. so you, you yeah. just let it dry out a little bit. But I can use the tractor forks or a spade. The other problem is, you know, we've got to, we drag our logs across the farm to the mill. And uh, rocks and stuff. Yeah. And you're picking up dirt and yeah. sand and rock and, uh, you know, you hit things like that. It's just not worth it. So get it, get them with the bark on to the mill site and then rip the bark off. It's a bit of a nuisance having all that bark around the mill site, but you can pick it up with a loader and, and, yeah. and, and get rid of it. I, but, think, uh, I think the Lucas mill handles the bark a bit better Yeah, than I'm that. sure it does, uh, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you've left the bark on this log. Yeah. I'll, t I'll take a photo of these both these mills and, and stick them up with the, with the podcast uh, notes. And, uh, yeah, you've left the bark on. To me, that would be... As soon as it's filled, you've probably got 12 hours to get the bark off. Otherwise, it gets really tight if yeah. particularly the sun comes out uh, and it becomes a real nuisance. So if, you, if, you, if you've got logs that you're cutting down in mid-summer or mid-winter, it can be really quite tricky. The other option is with the bandsaw is to just, uh, and we're looking at this, use some sort of debarker that fits to the chainsaw motor and you rip along oh, it just fits to the mill motor. So it goes along and it tears off the bark at the point where the blade goes in. Yeah. It doesn't matter so much where the band comes out of the log, but when it goes, it goes in, in, you don't want it picking up dirt, then mm. carrying it all the way through. Mm. On the outside, it'll just throw it so it won't tear at the blade. Yeah, um, I see on some of the YouTube channels, the mills, they have a little head that fits adjacent, just prior to the band saw yeah. going in and it just cuts a little groove yeah. out of the way. Yeah, I think, you know, the Europeans, things like oak, or if you're milling here, blackwood, it's very hard to debark yeah. those species. Yeah. And um, We generally not worry about debarking at all. Yeah. We, we, if we roll them across our pea gravel here, which is ironstone, yeah. they just embed into the soft, uh, smooth bark trees really well, so you've just got to make sure there's no rocks left in, the, yeah. in it when you're cutting. So what, um, what we're talking about eucalypts, what other species have you milled? Uh, I haven't done, well, I do all sorts, I suppose. I've done some beautiful um, uh, red cedar tree that grew in oh. someone's back backyard that got too big and because it was uh, one of the few native species that actually is deciduous in Australia, it drops leaves. Yeah, Australian red cedar, sort of Queensland, New South Wales species. Yeah. We, we grow it on our place. Not big enough to mill yet, but... I'm really keen to hear because uh, it's a ring-porous species. The faster you grow it, the denser the wood is. 
and better possibly the colour and yeah. performance of it. Have you got some of that I can take home? No, <laughs> the, guy, the guy I milled it for, is, um, he stacked it away beautifully and yeah. ended up selling it for a really oh. cheap price. Oh dear, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was in bailing up and it just grew. So it was probably yeah. a 60 centimetre diamond. Yeah. So it would have cut really easily, wouldn't yeah, it? it? Was it's much, yeah, yeah, much lighter, more uniform. Yeah. And I've cut some Paulonia, quite a large log of Paulonia. That's another very, um, it's a hardwood tree, but it's very light and soft to cut uh, and amazingly stable. The growth yeah. rings were a good inch apart. Um, and we just chucked the wood on the, in the shed floor and it didn't move. It yeah, was really awesome. wide. We had some good eight inch wide planks and they didn't cut, bow or twist yeah. or anything. Now I'm looking out, you've got... Uh, Little blackwoods coming up amongst, uh, well, not little, they're about eight to ten metres tall now, growing up under the eucalypts, and I really like that combination. Have you milled any Australian blackwood yet? No, not, not a lot. Yeah, not, you've got, not grown from here. No, um, not on anyone's farm? Uh, just trying to think back. Yeah. Uh, not, not a lot, right? Yeah. Not, is it, the, the sap band's quite wide, the stuff we've, yep. we have milled. Mm. Uh, the trees that we've grown here... Um, uh, have, yeah, they've got a very wide sap band, probably inch and a half, I suppose. Uh, it's quite light, mm. and and of course that's susceptible to borer. So these these are these other species. Uh, I suppose one of the reasons I got a bandsaw because you put a you can put a small log on a bandsaw, you can hold it, and you can resaw. Like if if so, if you for example had uh, picked up some previously milled timber that was ten by four, and you wanted to mill it up again, could you re Mill on a Lucas? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can do You'd that. You'd have to find some way of holding it in Surprisingly place. Surprisingly enough, I get right down to a small plinth at the bottom of this thing, and all I do is is chuck a couple of wedges at each side. And just to hold it. And, yeah. and it stays there pretty stable. Yeah. Once you get down to um, a piece, the bottom piece only an inch deep, uh, yeah, it can suddenly throw mm. it into the side of your leg, which isn't fun, but... I just put my leg against it. As a <laughs> well, the bandsaw is actually... That's interesting because the bandsaw, all the forces go sideways. Yeah. Here, you have less force sideways, possibly, because well, yeah, it's more yeah. lengthways. And, and as I get yeah. lower down and, the, and perhaps the log's going to move, yeah. um, it doesn't tend to move much, but mm. the last... I do two horizontal cuts, which are going to throw the log sideways. I just do a couple of... If I want to do an 8-inch mm. cut or 10-inch cut, do 3-inch do three, yeah. three cut sort of thing. Right. So we've been talking about the portable sawmill and that, I suppose that becomes the focus of many of us who are milling. But you need a lot of equipment around one. What have you got to get the logs here and what have you got after the, you've got a stack of timber? What yeah, other it's just a farm tractor with forks. That's yeah, all I do. that's all you use. Mm. And then you stack the timber. These are, we're sitting on green packs of uh, Sydney blue gum. Yeah, so they'll go straight to the... They'll go straight to uh, Bustleton where... Uh, they dry it in a kiln and machine it for me to flooring. So I sell the, this as ready to lay flooring and I pay the process of yeah. drying it and machining it. Yep. Um, and you can see some of these boards obviously are starting to cup already, especially in the yep. top. Oh, the backsworn ones. The backsworn <laughs> ones. <laughs> yeah. Backsworn boards do cup. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but they can. Well, well, I can do something similar. We could, because we've got a mill that can do the steam reconditioning which we have to do for some of our species because they're prone to collapse it also takes out about half the cup which i found interesting and then do the drying and then doing the finishing to board so both of us are doing that process very similar so for our house um, i've perfectly done what you've done they've done the drying and and finishing and we get back the floorboards and i've got to work out how much money i saved <laughs> because yeah obviously there's a lot of money in that finishing process but uh, yeah, with the price of timber, I think economically there's a there's a big saving there for for those of us who have taken at least the green timber. Uh, in another podcast, I'll talk about our solar kiln. We've we we stick out the timber and dry it, and for all the structural timber in our house, the pine and the and the eucalypt beams, and for much of the stuff furniture timber we've produced in the past, we've just done it with our solar kiln. But for flooring, I just got a bit nervous and said it's got to be perfect. So that's why I took it to a commercial place to do it. Mm. And flooring has a, carries a liability. If someone puts a floor down from your timber yeah. and it buckles or moves as it, 
and they'll tend to blame the timber, not the environment they've created, which could be right, could be either way. Uh, I just don't want to get myself in that situation. Yeah, so. I, think, I think there's a lot of it's to do in, in, in the laying and how dry the structure is they're laying it on too. Um, the local guy here does particular, is very particular about sealing the, the base floor, whether it be concrete or, or MDF. Okay. All this um, milling, that, all this timber we're milling ends up being only a 12 mil um, floor, yeah. not the normal 19 mil goes on, goes on bearers. So it either gets laid straight onto concrete, nailed into concrete or, or onto MDF. And the floor layer locally says the most important thing to do is to have that structure so it's well sealed. Any moisture will obviously come through concrete. Yeah, it if it's, if it's down floor. low on the concrete yeah. on the ground, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. he's very particular about yeah. how well the, the base is sealed. Uh, and good point, because I've seen where it hasn't been sealed well and the, the timber reacts, uh, you know, absorbs moisture and yeah. pushes stoves up off the ground and all sorts of weird well, things. Well, timber expansion is very powerful. Yeah. I think you've talked before about dado wars push, pushing, pushing doors out, doors out <laughs> because of the expansion and contraction and... Uh, that occurs, you know, timber just absorbs moisture and loses moisture and it swells as a result in, in a normal environment. It's interesting, I'm actually going home to lay our shining gum, farm grown shining gum floor next week. And, uh, but it is, it's on the second story, so it's, yeah, it's sealed so effectively by having air all around yeah, it. Yeah. And, um, I, think, I think we should talk about a bit about recovery, right? Yeah, okay, good. The, um, yeah, with, the, with this particular process of doing my flooring here, I've got an order for nearly 240 square metres and I'm wondering how many trees I'm going to use and how, how much recovery I get. I've just worked out that I've nearly finished this, this, this uh, particular job and I'm getting about, from the flooring I get out of each log, it's about 38% recovery. From so recovery to what? To what we're sitting on here, these you know, green to, boards? To what we, from the round log yep. um, to, to these green sawn wood. I'm not talking about the final yeah. final product. I'm talking about just ready to go to the yep. uh, the floor machinist. So 38% of the log I get in in u perhaps usable flooring. Uh, I've worked out there's probably uh, quite a bit of sawdust, obviously. Uh, 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 I think did I work it out last night? It was yeah. I, mi I milled up about. Uh, 16 cubes of logs in the round. I've got six cubes of, of uh, sawn product or flooring from it. And I think two cubes of sawdust. <laughs> well, and, and you surprised me last week on the phone. You said you, you actually make good money from that sawdust. Well, I'm, I'm, we have sold a couple of loads of truck loads in my son's um, large truck. Um, $500 a, a load. And I worked out roughly I'm getting... Half a, half a load of sawdust per tree uh, at, at, say, $250 per tree of sawdust, it's, it's better than <laughs> yeah. almost as good as the royalty that the mills used to pay us yeah, for that, the log. Well, yeah, and that sort of covers your costs, and what we're sitting on is a bonus. It yeah. uh, kind uh, of works out well. And yeah. then there's other, as I get to the edge of the log, there's obviously different sizes. I can't get my normal 130 yeah. mil. I can, I can cut some 110 mil wide, which still goes to flooring. And then uh, there's lots of stuff. There's a stack behind us that's um, like 50 mil and 75 mil wide. Um, we could obviously use for something. And mm. in the edge, I cut uh, st strippers or strip sticks to s stack wood on, timber on. And I was thinking the other day, I went to a local hardware store and tomato steaks are like two or three dollars each yeah. for six foot tomato steaks. So. Perhaps I should be cutting tomato steaks. <laughs> so the, the recovery... We're talking about these beautiful trees ending up in tomato steaks. Not all of it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. well, that's, uh, that's clear. As we're, recovery is the amount of um, product you're going to get out of the initial log, and it depends on what your market is, the size of the product. Uh, people often overemphasize recovery, but I'm saying, well, if you want 100% recovery, just use the round pole and stick it in the ground. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you need a floor, you can't use a round pole. No. You've got to mill it up. So there will always be, the more processing you do, there'll be losses through the process. Yeah, and, uh, and when you get back to the, the flooring that we're sitting on, uh, here it's, um, I, I allow for about 
another 20 per cent to come out of that that we'll, we'll lose. In You'll lose it after it's gone yeah, through the next obviously process. Obviously, it's, got, it's yeah. got to go through the yeah. machining process, and they'll find stuff, more faults that I, yeah. I dock out a lot of knots and stuff as I go, but there'll be cracks that happen in the yeah. drying process and twists and cups that will come out. Mm. But in, invariably, what I send over there, I'll get 20 per cent less. Yep. Um, from the flooring process. Yeah. So it's good to do the numbers, particularly if you're selling the product and trying to work out how much you're actually, yeah. how much value you're getting out of spending a day harvesting a tree. Well, let's let's take one of these trees. They're they're about 35 metres tall, we're saying, and 80 centimetres in diameter, say. Um, what's the volume, how much stem log is there and how yeah, much work's yeah. involved in... <laughs> I'm getting about... Five, five to seven lengths of mill log per tree. Uh, three metre lengths. Three metre lengths. We'll say four three metre lengths and then a couple of two and a half metre yeah. lengths. And once you get into the crown of the tree, obviously there's lots of branches and, and uh, larger branches that you can't process in the flooring. Small branches can probably get through, um, but the large ones you just dock out. Uh, and some very large longs, some where they all come out of the tree in the one spot, I just dock the, that section yeah. of tree off. But yeah, with flooring, you've got the advantage of they can utilise anything down to 50 centimetres long, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and they end match them and yeah. they go on yeah. a, a base so they don't have to go across a joist yeah. and be lost, so more you've got lost the in the process. advantage of, of utilising mm. a lot more with flooring than yeah. you do. Um, so with structural timber, obviously, yeah. you can't have big knots in the middle of your... No, you can't. You can't have short lengths of timber. Yeah. So these are all pruned trees. Uh, they were pruned when they were young, up to about six and a half or seven metres, I think. Uh, and then you've got a section where there's larger branches and you're getting some timber out of that, as we discussed for flooring, from between the large branches. And then from the top part of the tree, you cut up a lot of firewood. Yeah. Uh, when we were here with the Master Tree Grow Group, you showed us one tree, all the logs and all the firewood you got out... And there wasn't much left to burn. A few, you know. No, well, I've got a portable chipper too that fits on the three point linkage. A tractor or Adam's industrial chipper that he takes for his arborist work. You can chip all the leaves and, mm. and smaller branches. There's nothing left, really, if I can sell the sawdust and yeah. the tomato steaks and the, yeah. and the chips and the firewood. Actually, we, we cut a lot of firewood on the farm as well. And I guess that's. That's the ultimate in recovery because yeah, you burn the whole everything you, you cut apart <laughs> from the sawdust coming yeah. off to cut the rings. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, and and have you got markets? You got markets for most of those products now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The flooring, yeah. the uh, firewood markets. Yeah. Everyone still seems to want to keep warm with yeah. a, with an open fire or. Yeah. A, and with the closure of native fire. forests, is that changing the firewood well, prices? I, uh, I think what's happening is people are starting to use. Other species for firewood, yeah. like even Tassie blue gum, and people, are, the well, firewood that's... manufacturers are using anything now because people yeah. still want to burn. Well, it wood. used to be it had to be jarrah, or you couldn't, you know, yeah. it was crap, you know. Yeah. But blue gum is actually a bit denser than jarrah, and, and it's, it's it's a good firewood. Yeah. It makes a bit more ash. Yeah. Uh, tends to keep the fire going just as long as jarrah, if not a bit yeah. longer. Yeah. And so people are getting a bit more flexible. And yeah, that's good. So the recovery of the bandsaw mill. Uh, it, it so depends on what you're cutting out and the quality, but I suspect you, it could, you know, just because of the sawdust alone, it could be if you were cutting the same product the same way, presumably you get a bit more. Yeah, uh, I think I've got a 40 for 50% recovery. Last on night, I think, out of a cubic metre of, of sawn product, I, I can uh, approximately say I'll get 30 square metres of flooring mm. ready to lay. Yeah. Um, and I worked out the difference in the two curves last night, roughly, and I think I'd, I'd get an extra two square metres per cubic metre if I had a bandsaw. So a couple people. of hundred dollars more yeah, from the log if on the bandsaw. The, um, as I said before, I, um, to me, recovery is only can only be discussed in reference to the product you're producing. And, uh, and for people to go around and say that this mill produces a better recovery than that mill doesn't mean a lot unless they're producing the same product. Mm. And uh, so you need to be careful of that. And I much prefer the idea of uh, value recovery. How much, should we, how much value are we getting out of, of that log? And that depends on that person's opportunity to sell that and, and, and add value in some way. So 
milling is really about finding the right mill to suit some of the markets that you're going to deliver and also match the resource you've got. And more and more of us as landholders who've been planting trees for more than 20 years, and David and I have these trees I'm looking at, what are we up to now? 37, 37 years old. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and neither of us are ever going to clear fell our forests as in like conventional forestry. We, we're talking, I suppose we, we often mention to each other, we have this perpetual forest and you've got the choice each day to go out and spend some time harvesting one tree yeah. and look at value you can get from that one tree. But you've still got a forest. You've got hundreds of trees mm. and you've got other trees growing. It's uh, like a magic so this pudding. is you cut one down and the other tree next to it grows yeah, a bit that's faster. Right. Yeah, so a bit I tend to go out and pick trees that match what I'm looking for, but also mean that I'd leave the forest in a better condition because there's a tree next to it or under it or around it who needs some more space. Oh, yes. And there's this there's this great aspiration I have that we have forests across farms that are continually producing products, lots of different products. We'll have more sophisticated sawmills in some areas, taking uh, the majority of the logs, particularly if they're, you know, if most growers are growing one or two species, maybe a big mill can come in and start taking that. But there'll always be other lesser known species or one-off trees that, that these smaller mills can, can and, deal with. And, so. and they produce either a bandsaw mill or a Lucas mill. You can mill short logs only a metre long if you, if you, yeah. if you want to. Yeah. And no one's going to load them on a log truck no, and take them anywhere. No, fall between the staunches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, the, other, the other thing is time, comparing the, comparing the two mills. Um, time to, on a, on a bandsaw, you've got to cut the things into larger books and then you have to physically yeah. rotate them, which is much easier on, a, on your mill with the yeah. hydraulics. I've got the hydraulics to rotate um, the log. It's fantastic. The advantage on the Lucas mill is... is you're just cutting through the log, and every time yeah. you cut, you've got a piece of wood you can cut out. Yeah. Cut out. And I was, you mean, well, you talked about paying someone, but what about yourself? Do you enjoy a day milling? I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's much too slow uh, on your own. Oh, too slow on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you've got to walk out each piece of wood and yeah. put it. Yeah, well, I, I tend to do it all on my own. I, I sort of get in the zone, and I'm just enjoying yeah. thinking about it, where the next cut will be, getting the the best result. Yeah. Um, but yeah, timber is. As friends of ours told me, we run a mill. It's just manual handling. You're forever moving stuff around. Yeah. I think for our house building, I must must have tossed every stick stick of timber three or four times since it came off the mill. And yeah, gee, there's a lot of expense associated with it that. Is, in terms and of I don't think people who walk around on the floor appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I think uh, yeah. uh, people think you know, floors they all ch go chase for the cheapest thing. Well, they'll end up with the manufactured product because yeah. all that extra does work doesn't have to be done. Yeah, but um, yeah, when you see how much yeah. time you handle one piece of wood, uh, it's a bit like um, even firewood. I worked out the other day cutting firewood for, for our own house. I handle each piece of wood eight times, eight times yeah. before I get it into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, I've just put in a wood boiler. We'll have a have a show about that as well. Um, no, thanks, David. Well, we're going to catch up and talk every time I'm over there. Over here, we'll talk silviculture and you know, eucalypt saw logs because this is this property we're on here, and all this shed we're in. I didn't even talk about that. It's all made out of your farm-grown timber. We've got a pole pole shed with um, with boards on the wall, all cut from timber in this particular paddock we're right in, and that. Um, you know, we're building a house. Not every landholder is going to build a house with their own sawmill, but we all use timber. Yeah. And uh, if a neighbour's got a mill or someone, you know, this is, it's really important community asset. You know, I have people bringing logs over all the time. You know, Blackwood log fell down, can you mill it up? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you sort of feel like it's, it's part of what a community can have to, to get that. And so people aren't going out and buying timber mm. and they're sitting down at a table that they grew. We, should, we grew the shed and, and yeah. our son Adam, he, he did the process of building it done a fantastic job and uh, yeah there's nothing more pleasurable than than growing yeah. growing a tree milling it and then building something from it yeah mm -hmm. and uh, I think both of us are worried about people who just say you can't cut trees down because they're beautiful as they are and I say well you haven't 
you don't know what it feels like to sit at a table you grew. Yeah. That's also beautiful. It's yeah. also part of the story of the tree. Yeah. It's not like it's the end when the tree falls uh, because that forest is still there. The way we're managing our forests is perpetual. And uh, so the forest is still there, providing all those values. But on top of that, we've got the additional locking up carbon, sitting at a table with your grandchildren that you actually grew on the farm. It's, um, it's a great pleasure. And these machines just allow us to to expand our, diversify our farm production, get more value out of our forests, and also add value to our whole asset, which is the capital of our farm. Yeah, great. Uh, so thanks very much, David. We'll see how this goes and, uh, and possibly have some more. But uh, I love coming over here, and it's one of the most beautiful uh, tree-growing farms in the country or world. I travel a lot, and uh, if I saw this overseas, I'd, I'd be blown away. But it's right here in West Australia's backyard. We're down near Bridgetown in the southwest. Uh, just to help people out, what, what's the rainfall here? What do we... What are we sort getting of less, Getting less. <laughs> Dropping. The, old, the original rainfall here was uh, 800 millimetres, I think, yeah. in a year. But, um, and you've got about, so I'm going to guess, 500 acres. What's the property? 600 acres. Yeah. 600 acres. Hectares. Run beef cows, used to have sheep. Yeah. It's, a, it's a multi-enterprise farm. And uh, it's much more diverse now because timber is a product on top of uh, conventional agriculture. Yeah, and, and the other advantage of the, is that it's, it's like a, it's not what I call a Zimmer frame. I'll be able to keep walking back and forth. <laughs> when, yeah. I'm, when I'm 90, it's, it's just... <laughs> That's right, as long you as lean on the frame. You lean on the frame, as long as the logs aren't too big and you can just select small logs and just yeah. walk back and forth. Yeah. You end up in the same spot each time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I hope it keeps the dementia away as well. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. We'll see how we go. Thanks, and uh, I'll put a, a forward and an end on this, and uh, we'll see what people think of our little podcast discussions. Thanks yeah. a lot, David. Yeah, great. See you later.